and hopefully you're here to talk about, or at least hear me talk about, the aristocrat train engineer revolution. I think we honestly believe that this could revolutionize the way that most of us run our model trains. I've worked with a lot of different radio control systems over the years, and I find that this one, you really don't need the manual. And I'll be honest with you, the manual's pretty thick. I wrote it. But you don't really need it. It's a reference manual. If you have a question about, well, what does that exact function do, there might be a page about it. But when we talk about momentum, I'm going to explain it to you in 25 words or less, and I think you're going to understand it, so it's not that big a deal. From the start, it was really designed to let you work with your trains and not be a technician. I'm a technician. I'm a geek. I love to do that kind of stuff. I love to tear into things. A lot of people don't. When I talk to the Pittsburgh Garden Railway Society about electronics, Paul, right over, I see the glassy stare. I get maybe two people. I'm picking on Paul because he's a member of our club. When I first started putting this presentation together, I had about six slides of features. Well, you can read about the features, but I want to hit on about six or seven of them. First of all, information about the locomotive is put onto a rather large, backlit, bright, clear screen in English. And once you decode a couple of things that are you know, shorthand, you'll understand it perfectly. Again, the other radio control systems I work with, you have to remember, is that locomotive 1723? And then I have a little note written on there in pen, and I get into trouble because I forget what's what. Power can come from battery or from track power. I'm going to be running things on track power here, and if we have an opportunity, I'll switch over to battery to show you. It's no big deal. It can be either one. You can actually run your trains. If you've got track power on your trains, you can take a battery operating one and throw it on there and use them inter in intermixed, interchangeably. I tested this, because Lewis asked me when I got the, the original units, uh, uh, the test units back in November, what kind of range are you getting? Well, I said, well, if I go to the end of my driveway and across the street, it's about 200 feet. He said, no, you should get more than that. So I went down to the local park and I took this E8 and I stuck it on a bench, ran it on battery power obviously, and I started walking and about every 50 paces I'd hit the bell or the, you know, something I could hear and I'd flash the lights and stuff like that. I got well over 400 feet before it started to go out. I don't think too many of us have a layout and besides if you have a 400 foot layout chances are good you're running it from the middle. So if you exceed the range of this, you've got another problem. <laughs> Again, locomotives are identified in plain English. You'll see in a few minutes, I'm going to call the egg liner an egg liner. I'm going to call the E8 an E8. It's not going to be some obscure number. Most things can be done with one hand. You'll see in a few minutes, I've got the transmitter here inside of a little webcam so that I can show it to you but it fits nicely in the palm of your hand. It's a little bigger than your cell phone. To be honest with you, the cell phone is not real easy for me to use because I've got to pull my glasses out of my pocket every time I do it. This guy's big enough that I can see the labels on there without my glasses. Here's the biggest thing, and I put it in bold for that reason. Uh, when we started working with this in November, it had a certain version of the software on it. Immediately, feedback started going back to Aristocrat. I was on the phone all the time, email back and forth. The unit that you'll see today is dramatically different than the unit that I got in the mail in November. Right now, there are 150 people that have already purchased this as beta testers. Beta tester is someone who does a second series of tests after the alpha testers, you know, kind of give it a workout. I have a feeling that by the end of spring when that's done it's going to be not dramatically different but it'll be tweaked it'll be better and I'll be pointing out some things that have changed as we're talking this morning before we start working there are a couple of concepts that I want to get across to you and I'll be honest with you I struggled with them a little bit because I've never worked with a unit like this before uh, maybe they exist, exist in other scales but I don't work in other scales so I'm not really used to that First thing, the transmitter, the handheld unit, talks to a receiver inside of the locomotive. You actually put a separate receiver in each locomotive. 
you set up a lot of parameters within the transmitter. One is the name, the number if you want to give it a number, things like momentum, do you want the lights to work, do you want the lights to work normally or backwards, all sorts of things that you can put in. Most of which, by the way, are optional. You don't have to set them, but obviously name and number you want to put in there. And I have a list of some of the things that you have there. Once these are set in the transmitter, you push a little button on the, the locomotive, on the receiver, and the two devices talk, and they exchange information, they get introduced to themselves. And the transmitter gives that receiver a unique number that it cares about. We don't have to worry about it. And from that point on, if you want to change a characteristic in that locomotive, you change it in the transmitter and it talks to that receiver in a different way. The receiver still hears it and does what it's supposed to do. That's called linking. That's another change. When if we got the units back in November, it was called binding, which is more of a computer term. And we switched to linking because it makes more sense. So if you see anything in the manual that says binding, we missed it. We'll have to change it. All right, the second concept, and this is the one that we had trouble with. This is another place we changed the syntax, we changed the word. We're going with the, the metaphor, if you will, of the transmitter not talking to a locomotive or a train, but talking to an operator who's sitting in the cab running the train. The reason for that came to me, because I'm a little dense, if you've got an operator, Tom is our locomotive engineer, and he's sitting in that E8, could he have more locomotives behind him that he's operating simultaneously with his? Yeah, it's called a consist or a multi-unit or whatever. He could have, I don't know, six, eight, I don't know how many you get into those coal trains out in the west. But the bottom line is, if I'm talking to him, I'm really only interested in talking to that cab. I don't know how many locomotives are behind him, or in many cases care, because there's only one driver. So we could have called it a driver number, but we called it a cab number. And that's the number that you associate in the transmitter. You want to switch between locomotives, you change your cab number. I'm talking to cab, oh here's another one that'll bother you, cab zero. Computer people start with zero. I don't think that's going to change, get used to it. I count from zero because I'm a computer guy. But, you know, so I, there are 50 different cab numbers. What are they numbered from? Zero to 40, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> nah, I don't, I don't think we will. Uh, I've actually got into trouble in programs trying to change it because then I forget what my variables are supposed to do. I have to add one, to, uh, okay. The cab numbers go from cab zero to cab 49. And that's the number that you want to use when you identify the locomotive. It'll still pop up with egg liner or E8 or whatever, but that's what you use to change locomotives. Here's the cool part. And this was a big change. This, was a dr this didn't do this in November. It did not do this in November, and that was a criticism that we had. It's been fixed, and I think fixed, I'll use the word elegant because I think it's pretty nice. Let's say that we have three locomotives. These three guys right here are separate locomotives. And we set you up as cab zero, you as cab one, you as cab two. We're running the trains, I can switch, I can make you go fast, slow, whatever. Then I want to come up with a consist composed of those three locomotives. I simply go into the transmitter and go to the next cab, which would be zero, one, two, three, and say, put this one at position one, this one at position two, this one at position three. When I pick cab three and I say go fast, all three go fast. When I say go backwards, all three stop and go backwards. Everybody with me? That's pretty cool. I don't have to go pushing that button in there and doing the linking and all that. I just say, here's another cab, and could I have another cab, maybe cab five, that's only these two? And another one that's these two? And another one that's these two? As long as I, you would have to remember a little bit, I remember I set up five for this and five, you know. It's pretty cool. Elegant, eh, maybe, my word. Okay, changing between, here's an initial, you have, you have to remember SU means single unit, so when, when Tom's running by himself, he's a single unit, but, or MU, which is the multiple unit, is when we have them together. And I'll show you all of this. I won't read that to you, but there's my word elegant up there. 
it makes sense to me. Okay, the transmitter screen is designed to clearly and logically display lots of stuff. There it is. Let's talk about it for a minute. Brought my laser pointer, I'm going to use my laser pointer. I hope you understood the concept that I presented a few minutes ago that the transmitter handheld and the receiver and the locomotive talk to each other. As a matter of fact, the FCC had to approve both the transmitter and the receiver because they're both transmitters. So they talk. This guy here tells you how strong the signal is coming back. Make sense? That's pretty cool. If that starts dropping down, you're getting closer to the end of your range. This is single unit operation. This is the E8, which is this fellow right here. Uh, that's the road number. I put it in a 0, 0500. You could leave the 0 out and just make it space 500. It doesn't matter. That happens to be a 500 right there. Cab 0. I have this one set up as the first operator, the first cabin. Okay. Uh, this one may be confusing until I tell you DL stands for delay and the 2.0 is S second. When I say I'm running forward and I hit the backward button, it'll slow down nicely and it will delay for two seconds and then it will go the other way. You can change that from zero up to, I forget what the maximum is. That's what's in the manual, you see. Or you can just keep pushing the button until it stops taking it. You know. This is cool. Do you see the up arrow and the down arrow? Okay? The up arrow 100 means you may give this 100% of the power that's available as a top speed. So if you're running on 19-point on whatever voltage batteries, if you go the whole way up, that's what it's getting. Now why is that cool? Because I can change this. If my nephew Phil is coming over, and I know that Phil likes to run my trains off the end of the track, I can change that to 60. Now unfortunately, if Phil is a typical child, he'll know how to change it or he'll figure it out. You have parental controls? Well, you know what, I had a gentleman yesterday, I did this seminar yesterday morning, he said, well, do you have a way to stopping that? I said, yeah, you. <laughs> if you see the kid go for it, I also said you could put super glue on the menu key. The second number, this one I like even more, zero percent. That's the startup speed. I have many locomotives at home that on my, my older aristocrat uh, train engineer. I've got to hit that button for a while before it starts because it takes, say, seven volts before it moves. A lot of the magazines publish that, you know, what the startup voltage is. Well, if I realize that I have to get up to 20 percent of power before it goes, you make that a 20 and as soon as you hit the go fast button, it jumps to 20. That's pretty cool. So I'm, I'm not pushing the button or holding it down to get up to 20. Now, we debated about this. When this was first in its draft stage being designed, we were going to use miles per hour. And then it was like, well, what scale? Uh, what if you're running 12 volts instead of 18 volts or 22 volts? So we threw this, this miles per hour out the window and it's percentage. What this means is the train is running at 22% of its maximum voltage. And you're going to have to deal with that because there's, there is no good way. How many scales do we deal with typically? You know, everything from 132nd down to who knows what. 20 for sure. So that speed is, is 22, call it percent. And this is just a graphic. This is pretty self-explanatory direction. The train's going that away to the right, and obviously if you push the direction button, it goes the other way. Uh, PWC is pulse width control. I call it PWM. It's, it's a way of um, adjusting the voltage that goes to the motor of a locomotive. That can change, and we may talk about that a little bit later. There, there eventually will be a trackside version of this that will run either PWC or linear. Next to it, this is an important number this number tells you how quickly speed is added when you hold the go fast button. If you have this set to one, and I hold the go fast button, I don't have the manual right handy, I'll have to look it up because it's in there. It tells you each second how much it increases. I think it's like one. So if you have it at one and you hold the button down, it takes forever to get to 100. If you make it two, I think it jumps by twos. If you make it three, it jumps by fives. If you make it four, it jumps by like tens. 
So if you want to really zoom, you change it to a higher number, which is pretty neat because that is something that's personal preference. You can adjust it. Recall that I said it's bidirectional. This says the link between the transmitter and receiver is okay. They're talking. If that goes away and says no link, then you've lost control or you've shut it off. This spot right here, something I forgot to mention to people yesterday, also bidirectional. The receiver, if you're run, let's say that you're pulling way too many cars and it's 117 degrees out in Texas, if the receiver overheats, it shuts down and this thing will say overheated. That's pretty neat. Now I know why it stopped. You let it cool, you hit the zero button, which is also used for reset, and it'll start up again. If you get a short circuit, if you're running track power, doing something evil or something bad happens, this will say over current, and it'll shut down, correct the situation, it'll start back up again after you hit the zero to reset. And finally, this is the voltage in the batteries. The transmitter takes three AA batteries. You know, it, it will take rechargeables, there's a recharger. I've been running the same set of you know, decent quality Maxell AA battery since November. And it's still doing okay. So I think the battery's gonna last a long time. The, the backlight on the display is probably the biggest eater of power, and it shuts off after, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds of, of non-use. Any questions up to there? The backlight be controlled. Say again? The backlight be controlled. The time on the backlight cannot be controlled, but the time until the transmitter shuts off can be. Because it will, excuse me, it will shut down. That transmitter is now off because it timed out. And that can be adjusted. Now, if, if the beta testers say, I want to change the backlight, could that be added? Absolutely. That's a software change. So, yeah, it could maybe by the time they're being sold, you know, beyond the beta test, yeah, who knows? I was wondering if, you know, how the backlight works with direct sunlight. And you're Very spray. well. You're wearing UV sunglasses sometimes. I have no, yeah, I know what you, yeah, the polarized. I don't know. Right, go to a gas station. Yes. I'm not sure if that has that or not, to be honest with you. I don't have my glasses, the sunglasses with me. Yeah. Uh, when the, like, the original train engineer, it would time out. When you go to hit a control, be dead. Happens, you had to turn the on button. Yes. Is this the same thing? Yes. Right? You have to hit an on button, then you just can't hit a control. That is correct. But if you're getting into situations where that's an issue, you can just, I believe there's a way to set in the menu, no timeout. It'll kill your batteries faster, but, you know. Not a big deal. Yes, sir. Is there going to be any changes to make the field go beyond 50 caps? In one transmitter, uh, Lewis tells me it could, but realistically, are you going to try to juggle 50 locomotives? Well, when you've got configuration on system yeah. in there. I do. Uh, That's my answer, though. Yeah, if, if, you, if you need it, it might happen. But again, if only one or two people want it, they're not likely to make that change because it's going to add complexity to other people. My recommendation, if you've got 100 locomotives, buy two transmitters. Obviously, money's not a problem if you've got 100 locomotives. Yes, sir. <laughs> Will they interfere with each other? I think you'd have to do it manually. You'd have separate, uh, yeah, they don't talk. They will. You, you can, though, set different channels. So you could have hundreds, if not thousands, of transmitters in the same area without any interference. Can you dump it? I don't believe you can. Could that happen? Yes. That's something that could be done through software. Is there enough demand to justify the... I don't know. Yeah. Yes. When it comes out and you turn it back on, the trains shut down or they keep going? They keep going. Yep. And if the, if the locomotive gets out of range, let's say that you've got a thousand foot main line, it keeps going. Yeah. And again, that's something that could be programmed. Uh, if that becomes an issue, they could put something in it, lost signal stop, which they do on like radio control things. They'll start to circle. But yeah. In our trains, they know how to come back. Well, okay. All right, there's two sets of buttons on the transmitter. At the top are what I call operation specific buttons that are used to run the trains. And at the bottom is essentially a cellular phone style uh, keypad. And we'll talk in detail about that now. You remember I told you we changed things since, no since November? Do you remember we used to call it track number? Now it's called cab? Well, my picture still has a T. 
and chances are good that the beta testers are going to have T's, but it should be a C. Well, the molds have been made. Maybe the next time they make them, it'll be a C. But that's what that is. That's how you change caps. So if you want to switch locomotives, just push the right one or the left one. Right one goes up, left one goes down. Go fast, go slow. Go left, go right. Ah, stop. But I do want to add something, and I think, I think Lewis has in his notes to change this on the next, uh, what do you call it, release. Stop, slash, enter. Because when you're doing menus, that's the enter button. So you'll, you'll hear me saying, I'm going to press stop now. I'm actually hitting enter. Menu takes you to the, mm -hmm. on off takes you, well, obviously, power. Uh, let me make a quick comment now because I don't want to forget later on. I think I have this in my notes. You notice the buttons are all different shapes. It took me about 30 seconds to start running this thing without looking at it. Put your finger on the stop and you know immediately fast, slow, backward, forward, menu. You don't want to hit menu when you're not you know, looking because you can't do much. But you get the idea? It's very conducive to one hand operation without the eyeballs working. Okay, the information buttons are the same as on your cell phone. How many of you folks are, are competent at adding phone numbers to your cell phone and names? How many of you have your kids or grandkids do it? Yeah. <laughs> how many of you know how to answer a call? And <laughs> okay. Well, you know what? You get one of these systems, you're going to learn how to run your cell phone. Because in order to put a name in, there, there are a hundred different ways to do text entry. They could have put a whole alphabet on the keyboard and then the whole gizmo would be this big. If you want to enter the number five, obviously you hit five, but if you hit five a second time, you get J, the next time K, the next time L. That's the way your cell phone works. And by the way, if you go too far, it starts over again, so it's no big deal. You'll see me screw up and go past and have to go over again. Number one is used for one, plus it's also the punctuation. So if you wanted to have road number 5-32. Or let's say that you've got uh, two road number 50s. 50-1, 50- or 50A, or you know, you could do that. It, you can put in letters with road numbers, by the way. And the bottom right-hand corner. Who has a Verizon phone knows what the bottom right-hand corner button does? Space. Yeah, let's put the space in. Yes. Use the arrow keys to go back. The, the left and right, yeah. I mean, it's, it's real logical. I mean, yeah. And also, now, when you're putting in uh, road names, that's obviously a menu function. Let's say you're running your trains. If you hit one, it activates auxiliary function one, which I'll show you on most of my locomotives is a bell. And if you hit two, it does auxiliary function number two, which on mine, I think I've set up as a whistle. I always have been setting up number six, by the way, as the smoke unit, because I'm not real smart, and I don't want to forget about the smoke, because that draws a lot of power. I want to make sure which one I'm fooling with. So I make number six smoke. This is an important one. It even says it, all stop. If you hit the stop button, it only stops the locomotive that's under control cab zero, cab one, cab two, whatever you're actually running. If you hold down the zero, and you have to hold it down for about two seconds, because you know they don't want it to be hair trigger, because it'll kill everything. You hold it down for about two seconds, and what it does is it sends out a broadcast uh, one after the other. Like if you have uh, six trains set up, it'll send out stop zero, stop one, stop two, stop three. You'll see it go through that list, and they'll all stop. And there is an auxiliary menu that you're probably not going to use too often, and that's accessed by hitting this button again when you're running the trains. And we'll use this one over here for some uh, multiple unit operation on consists. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes. There's the receiver. And if you haven't been over to the Aristocraft, uh, take a look. I mean, Lewis has a bunch of the things opened up. You can actually take a look. It's about that big. It has a socket for the auxiliary wiring harness. Now what that is, is that six outputs that can be used to control any electronic thing. Sound, smoke, lights. You want to have a little guy pop out of a hatch, build something, the little guy will pop out of a hatch. The link switch. Remember I told you you have to push a button on the receiver to get them to start talking to each other initially? 
There's the button right there. Now, if you've got a locomotive where you can get in to the, hit that button, that's all you need. But if you need to put that button someplace so you can get to it when the shell's back on the locomotive, there's a separate button that comes with it that plugs in there so that you can put it someplace else. And I'll show you that in a few minutes, too. The antenna's only an inch and a half long. Keep the antenna vertical when you mount it, which means either this way or this way. It doesn't matter. Better. Again, another look at the receiver. On the bottom of the receiver, there are two headers. I've got a better picture of this later on. One's got 12 pins, one's got 10 pins that plugs right into an Aristocraft plug-and-play socket. Uh, someone asked yesterday, does it plug into other locomotive sockets? I don't know the answer to that, but I've heard that it does to some Bachman engines. But again, that's a question for Lewis. He would be able to tell you, or to Navin, the young man who is over at the Aristocraft booth. Does the wiring diagram come with the package? The wiring diagram for this whole unit? No. Oh, the wiring diagram, how to, how to make it go? For this right here, yes. Yes. Because what, what I want to say now uh, plays right into what you're asking. What if you have a locomotive that's not plug and play, like my little egg liner? It comes with a, an auxiliary uh, wiring harness plug that plugs into the 12-pin header that gives you two wires that go to the wheels, two wires that go to the motors, three wires that go to the lights. Track power or battery? How many run track power? How many run battery? How many run both? <laughs> okay. Your choice. Doesn't matter. And again, you can run some locomotives on track power, some locomotives on battery. The cool thing about track power, you can go out and buy a, let's say, 23 volt DC power supply and hook it right to the track. That's what I'm doing here. There's no controller on this power supply. This is a standard Crest. DC power supply, and I've got alligator clips going right to the track. So there's 23 volts on the track the whole way down the line. That's nice if you've got some dirty spots on your track, because you know as well as I do, when your train's going very slowly on track power and hits the, the bad spot, there's not that much power to kind of jump that gap. If it's running 23 volts, it's much more likely to keep on going. Not guaranteed, but more likely. Okay, track power, no controller needed, battery power, a uh, bunch of different batteries. Uh, the Aristocraft table over there has some new ones. There's some new uh, nickel metal hydride packs that look very attractive. I think I may wind up with some of those soon. I'm sorry? Question on track voltage? Uh, maximum of 24. Okay, some power packs uh, without a low produce more than 24 volts. Try to keep it at 24. Right. I'll tell you a little story. Stop the tape. When I was, uh, when I was uh, experimenting, I have two bench power supplies on my, my workbench. One goes 0 to 18 volts, one goes 0 to 30. I thought I was hooked up to the 0 at 18. I cranked up the, the power supply the whole way because I wasn't watching. Right. I went to 30. That's the one that's in the egg liner. It's fine. I don't think you want to do it all day. And the other thing that's going to happen, as soon as you put a load on it, that's going to drop. Yeah, that's what I was talking yeah. about. So it does drop. David says he's gotten away with it. Right. Lewis says don't do it. Right. So there is no protection in that unit for excessive voltage. Well, sure there is. But what's going to happen is it's going to overheat, and I think in time it's going to kill it. Yeah, there's a voltage regulator, there's a whole diode network in there, bridge rectifier, yeah. But again, best choice is to keep it at 24 or fewer volts. Both on the same track, okay. How do you put it into a plug and play locomotive? These are pictures of the, uh, the E8. When we're done, if you'd like me to open it up, I got the screws out, I'll show you the installation. It's kind of silly for me to hold it up here and say, look at this, because you're not going to see it too well from where you're seated. This is the plug and play board. If you take the shell off of that E8, right above the uh, switches that do smoke and things like that is that board. As a matter of fact, that's one of the vents in the top of the shell. And right here, let me circle it with the... Locate the plug and play socket. You pull this little guy out. This guy comes right out. It's a plug that goes into that header so you can run it without the radio control or whatever. There's the better picture. Identify the 12 pin and the 10 pin header. And I will caution you about this. It is possible to misalign these when you plug it in. Check it twice, then check it again, because if you have it off by one, you could do a bad thing to it. So that's kind of on you, and it's you know it's not asking too much. Be careful. Identify the headers. 
And all you do is, this is the receiver, you plug it into the 12 pin here and the 10 pin here. There, here's that extra wire that goes to, remember I told you the separate uh, switch for linking? We'll look at that again in a minute. But that's it, that's the installation, you're done. Now if you want to add smoke control or you want to add sound control, there's more work to be done. But that's all detailed, Just, did everybody get a CD? If not, there's some up here. I wrote a bunch of stuff over the last year about how to make this thing work and how to interface it and how to wire it up. Uh, do you have troubles? Yeah, go ahead, call me. My phone number's on my website. You know, I'd be glad to help you with it. Within reason. There's the external linking switch. You can put that anywhere you want. I'm not a big fan of drilling holes in my locomotives. So on the E8, the back door opens. So what I did, there's the button. And there's David's big thumb. And that's all I have to do is reach in there and push it and I'm in business. On the egg liner, I didn't want to cut a hole in my egg liner because that's a brand new egg liner. Everybody know what a reed switch is? I glued a reed switch to the inside of the body right about, I got a mark right there I think, and I put a little dot on there to remind me where it is. And when I want to do any linking, all I do is bring a magnet by that and you're in business. Okay, what I'm going to do now, I have about... 10 or 15 slides, and in, in the event that my little camera didn't work, I have a video there, but we don't need that. I'm going to actually try to do some of this stuff live. So with that, I'm going to borrow this chair, because if I stand up and do this, you're not going to be able to see. And if David doesn't have his glasses, he's not going to be able to see. All right, first thing I want to do is turn this little gizmo on. Okay, that's a, a live picture of the screen. And it's not wonderful, but it's not bad. Everybody see that reasonably well? Okay. What I want to do, I'm going to hit the menu button, and I'm going to hit the down arrow. Oh, by the way, can you see in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little down arrow right here? That means that there are more than five items, which is kind of nice, because it tells you it's not a list of five, it's a list of at least six. So I'm going to push the down arrow a couple times, I'm going to go to reset memory. I'm going to hold down the stop button, which is enter. Am I sure? Yes. Hold this down for two or three seconds. Wait. Okay, this now is the same as it comes from the factory. So I'm going to have to start from scratch to introduce it to my stuff. So I'm going to hit menu. We're right back where we started. Notice it no longer says egg liner or whatever. It says L49, cab zero, and okay. Hit the menu key. First item, assign functions. That's what we're going to do. Link address. This is an internal number that goes from zero to 49. It's not the same as the cab number. It's actually the number that the transmitter uses to talk to the receiver. I always start with zero. You could start with 49 and work your way down. I'll tell you a trick though. If I wanted to go from 49 to 0, I'd have to push the left button like 48 times. If you hit the enter button, it goes to 0. I don't know if that's in the manual. I think I put it in. Now it's 0. Pretty cool. Go down. Receiver type on board. There will be other types of receivers, like one for switch motors and things like that and accessories, but right now it's an onboard receiver. Locomotive name. All right, let's call this one the E8. How do I do that? I go down and I find the E and I ha it happens to be on the 3 D E F. So I hit 3 D E. E. Push the right, well I don't actually have to push the right arrow, it goes to the right by itself. Hit the 8 once. Oh, it's an E80. How do I get rid of the zero? Space is in the bottom right, hit the zero. Or space right, it's gone. Uh, road number, I'm going to put in space. And I think you may recall that's a 500, so 5, 0, and you'll see me looking back and forth. There's something called latency. I push a button on here, it doesn't show up on the screen for about a half a second, so it makes me crazy. So you'll see me confirming things. All right, momentum. The lower the momentum number, the faster the locomotive will achieve the speed you have set. If you've got a locomotive that's supposed to model an extremely heavy locomotive pulling a, a coal train, 
You might jack your momentum way, way up to 50, 60, 70 percent. You can experiment with this. And as you accelerate it, that number goes up to 100 real fast, but your locomotive won't. It'll take maybe 10 seconds to get up to it, that speed. Make sense? I generally leave it low because I'm impatient. But, yeah, okay. Uh, delay. Remember we talked about that? When you go from forward to reverse or reverse to forward, how, much, how many seconds? Let's change that to uh, 1.5 just to be different. Down arrow again. Ah, motor normal or reverse? When I put the egg liner together, I wired it backwards. I didn't have to rewire it. All I had to do in the, in the menu is change it to reverse. And now when I tell it to go forward, it goes backwards. When I tell it to go, you, know, you get the idea. If, and if you're running something at AB units and you've got things turned around or whatever, there's also a switch on some locomotives for NMRA and, G, and you know, it corrects it. It's kind of nice. Uh, headlight direction, normal, or would you rather have the headlight on when it's going backwards, which you would do if you had an ABA? Do you want the headlight on at all? On or off? Ah, uh, there's that uh, cousin Johnny or whoever he is. Let's uh, take that down to uh, something else. So now this locomotive will never get more than 75% of its maximum voltage. And let's just say, uh, I know that that E8 doesn't start doing anything until about 20. So we'll set that at 20. Okay, auxiliary functions. Remember I told you about the bell and the whistle and things like that? It's easy to set up. First thing, auxiliary mode basic. In auxiliary mode basic, which is what you get with the receivers that are shipping now or will be shipping soon, there are six functions. If you go to the advanced mode, there will be 16, but that doesn't exist yet. So it's just something that's in there for later. Leave it at basic. What this is, when I hit number one, which is function one, will it be a momentary uh, pulse or will it be a latch? So for a bell, a whistle, uh, a, a coupler noise, they're all momentary. But what did I say I was going to use number six for? Smoke. I'm going to change that one to latching because I don't want to have to hold the button down to make the smoke smoke. OK. I'm done. Hit the menu. That takes you back a step. Now, linking. And I'm going to set this down. I'm going to go over to the E8. I'm going to turn the power, oops, excuse me, power on. Watch the headlights. They should be lit. I'm going to hold the button if I can find it. There it is. Lights blinking. What's that mean? It's in the linking mode, which is also if you have sound, it's shut off. And I hit uh, enter here. Linking has passed. What does that mean? They've established a relationship. And now if I go back, <laughs> you have to do two more things to get it to operate. Because everybody's going to want to go back and run their train now. It won't work. First thing you do is you got usage of cab. I, and that's, to my mind, poor syntax, but you'll understand what it is in a minute. Your price number has not been claimed. Six, four, two, four, two, three. This will be a 92 minute Last presentation. Numbers, 24, 23. Yeah. Last four numbers, 24, Quick question. 23. When you first turn the power on, most trains are going to take off. When, no. you, when you're doing this, it's. But keep in mind, the question was when I first turned the power on, why didn't the train take off? That track power goes to the receiver. The receiver knows I haven't said go. Okay. So it's. You don't have to worry about no, if that happens, something's bad. <laughs> okay. Oh, backlight just kicked out. How long was that since I pushed the button? About a minute, two minutes. And all I need to do is... Uh, it's just doing its automatic uh, contrast. If you have only three or four engines, then you set the cab number. Back. This, this sets the, the range of cabs that you're going to have. This is set to have how many cabs? Don't say five. Six. <laughs> We're going to leave it at six. What's the biggest number it'll go to? 49. But if you have it at 49 and you happen to hold down the T key, the, the, it'll, it'll scroll right up to 49 and you've got to go right back the whole way even though you only have five. So why have that range when you don't need it? And when you hit all stop, it's going to send packets to 50 locomotives. 
that you don't have. So leave it low. That's my point. So if, if you change that um, down the road, so uh, all it is is you have to change on every one of the no, configurations, no. Or is that just the whole That's thing? just telling it how high it'll go on the menu. That's it. Okay, now this is the biggie. Remember that number we used a while ago, I said, is not the cab number. That's just for the relationship between the transmitter and receiver. Now we're going to associate a cab number with an actual locomotive. I always start with cab zero. By the way, if you don't like zero, make it one. But I'll tell you, zero is still going to show up as a choice, so you're better off to start with zero. Multiple unit mode is off. We're not doing consists or multiple units. We'll do that in a few minutes. And we're down to here. Well, it wants me to work with locomotive 49. No, no. How do I get back to zero? Hit enter or stop. Oh, look at that. It knows that zero is an E8. Now I've done a configuration that says the E8 is locomotive zero, cab zero, if you will. I keep reaching for the computer keyboard instead of the little bitty keyboard. Okay, let me hit menu. Now, look what's up there. Uh, my little laser pointer. The name is an E8. There's the road number. There's my max is 75. My startup is 20. My delay is one and a half seconds. Single unit operation, no speed. But it's going to go that way. Oh, one thing I also forgot yesterday to say to folks. You can change the direction before you start the train. Does that make sense? On, on some things, I've found that you have to get them going, then you hit reverse. But on this one, it doesn't care. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it go. I'm going to hold the up. By the way, as soon as I hit the up speed button, it's going to jump to 20. And I don't know if you can see the wheels. Are they spinning? They sure are now. Yeah. Laser pointer doesn't help much. And if I press number one, well, it's just the number one on the keypad gives you the function one, right. Number two, and if you watch the screen, I'm going to hit number six. You see where it'll flash F6? I don't know if you saw it. And with a little bit of luck, if I have the switch thrown and I have juice in there, it'll smoke. I can see smoke, but you may not be able to. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. And you get the idea why I needed to make that latching. Otherwise, in order to do smoke, I'd be literally holding it down and not doing much else. You automatically just get the crossing signal? That's a dally card, and it does them randomly. So, no, I did not. Well, yeah, I did, but I didn't have anything to do with it. If I hit it again... What uh, I believe on Phoenix Sound, can you set different whistles for different functions? I think you can. Okay, so yeah, you could have number two do a crossing and number three do whatever else. You could also set it to momentary so that uh, number two did a short and number three did a long. Okay? Yeah, yeah. What about the smoke then? Does that stay on the whole time? Until I hit, uh, hit, let's hit six again. It'll say F6, and there it goes, it's dead. Just a quick recommendation, if you're going to run battery, smoke units draw almost as much power as your locomotive. So it'll, it'll kill them in you know, significant time. Yes, sir? On this unit, I don't believe it does. I believe it's on or off. So there are some steam locomotives that are tied to a bellows and stuff. This one is just a really nice smoke unit, but I think it's, it's constant. Okay, I'm going to get out of your way again, and we're going to continue. Uh, let, me, let me go back to my slides, because... Okay, uh, I went through this. I went through the, uh, the options. Uh, link button, we did that. We did that. We did that. We did that. 
We did that, we did that. Oh, I didn't change direction. Let me go back to here. We're going forward if I hit, that's the backlight again. If I hit the left, see this, it shows it's changed direction, but it actually hasn't because the momentum, it's gonna stop completely for a second and a half, then it's gonna start up in the other direction. Okay, back to my notes. All right, let's do it again with the egg liner. And go back to my display. Let's, let's stop this fellow. And let's go to menu. Same thing, assign functions. I use the right arrow to make that zero a one, because I need a blank one. On board. Okay, egg liner. This is going to be more work. E. And you have to pause for a second if you're using the same key to let it go to the right. E G G L I N E Egg liner. It has no road number. I could blank it out. I'll just make it one two, five, zero. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, momentum's not going to mean much to an egg liner. Delay, I'll just leave it alone. Motor's normal. Oh, no, the motor's backwards. Remember I told you I wired it wrong. So we're going to make that, whoop, went the wrong way. Reverse. Uh, headlight direction normal. Headlight's going to be on. Top speed, sure, we'll let the kid run it off the track. Start speed. Actually, the egg liner starts up pretty quickly. We'll leave it at zero. Auxiliary functions. Everything is uh, momentary because it has a Phoenix sound. All it, it doesn't have a smoke generator in it. Okay, linking. Now, I believe, I believe I brought a magnet. Ha <laughs> ha. It helps when you got your toolkit. And you know what else I need? I need to find the little dot. <laughs> there it is. There's a little dot right there. That's where the read switch is. So, you see the lights blinking? That's how I know I hit it, which is kind of nice. Put that down. Put this here. Hit go or stop or whatever it is. Pass. They're now connected. So, hit menu. Hit menu again. But what did I forget to do? That's right. And yesterday, nobody stopped me. I went back and said, where's the egg liner? I played dumb. I pretended I did it, but I forgot. <laughs> You'll do the same thing. You've got to associate a cab number with the egg liner to get it to operate. So what do we do? We don't need to worry about usage of cab. Let's go down to add MUSU cab. Cab one, I'm going to hit the right arrow. I'm going to hit zero to get back to zero. That's the E8. Hit the right arrow. I'm now egg liner. Hit menu, menu. Now it says egg liner. And if I press the left cab key, whoop, it says E8. If I hit the right one, it's egg liner. See what's happening? I'm hitting the, the, t, the those T keys that will be C keys eventually. Uh, we should be on egg liner. Let's hit the up arrow. Now notice, it's going up by ones. That's right. If you change this uh, number three down here to something smaller, it goes up by smaller increments. The egg liner is rolling. I can... Uh, the wheels are... are spinning, which is good. And if I hit one, and I can't remember if that one shuts off after a second hit or if it's timed. Okay, hit two. I think it's a coupler noise or something. There's a whistle. Uh, the speaker does not have any way to get the sound out. I didn't want to pop the windows out, so it's not wonderful. Okay, I'm going to stop that by hitting stop. And we're in business. Now, I can run those two trains independently on the same track with track power. 
I can also take one of the batteries, plug it in, switch it over to battery power, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. But let's now take those two locomotives, which I hope you would never run as a consist, and let's make them one. Yeah, if you've got an E8 in the front, way back at the end of your coal train, you've got an egg liner pushing up the rear. But let's, let's do it, because that's all I've got to work with, guys. Okay. Tell Lewis to increase his budget. There you go. Maybe get a dash nine next time. Okay, I'm going to go down. All I need to do is go to that third item. That's it. And what do I do? Cab number two, we have to go to a new cab. Multiple unit on. And it gives me six positions. What I'm going to do is go to the first one, hit zero to get back, or stop rather, to get back to zero. E8 is the first one. Go down, hit the right arrow, egg liner. I have now, how hard was that? And I'm done. What if, what if you wanted to go in reverse like you're... You'd have set that up in, in the uh, initial setup for the egg liner. You with me? You'd go to the settings for um, the egg liner in the other menu option and you'd make it reverse there. But I'm going to have them both going forward so it doesn't matter. All right, but, but you know, maybe I'm a little confused. You just had two E8s, let's say. You'd reverse one of them. You'd have to go back to that one now and yes. put it in as reverse. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. Okay, hit menu, menu. Now, if I hit... The T button, let's go down. Cab 0 is the E8 SU in the upper left hand corner. Cab 1 is the egg liner SU. I'm going to hit it again. Cab 2 says MU, and the 1 means unit 1 is the E8. Do you recall I told you at one point that the, uh, the star in the bottom left hand corner was going to be used for something? I'm going to press it. Watch what happens. MU2 is egg liner, and it goes back. MU1 is E8, MU2 is egg liner. Why is that important? If I want to ring the bell on the E8, I have to have it looking like that, or turn the smoke on. If I want to ring the bell on the egg liner, I have to be there, but how hard is that? Boom, boom, I switch between them. Now, if I say go fast, And you notice that the E8 is up to 37, but the egg liner is only at 18. Why? Because the egg liner started at zero and the other one started at 20. And they're, I think, both running. And if I hit, uh, let me go a little faster because that'll be fun. I'll hit reverse. They both slow down, stop, and go the other way. You had four dash nines from it. So you'd have to you'd scroll through all that and turn the smoke on for all four. Yes. Yes. There is no way currently to turn the smoke on on all of them, but it's, it's not that big a deal to be able to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, it doesn't. I'm going to turn this off because I can't hear a thing. <sighs> Normally, when I'm working on these on my bench, I turn them way down so I can barely tell they're there. Uh, you have to set that up. And, and obviously, you would not do a consist of engines like an E8 and an egg liner. You're going to match them. So you shouldn't have any issues with that. Now, the same question came up yesterday. I said, you know, guys, if you're going to try to do something goofy, you're going to have to experiment a little bit. But within the limits of the, of the unit, and I will also be quite honest with you, I don't have but two of these receivers, and I haven't experimented with what you're talking about. But I got a feeling these beta testers are going to go crazy. And they're going to be hooking up, you know, umpteen dozen, well, six is the maximum, but, okay. Let's go back to my notes. Yes? You know the maximum on the egg liner is 100%. If you're running it in with the E8, it's only going to go to the maximum of the E8. I think it'll go to 100. Let's, let's find out. I don't know because I haven't tried it. Let me, let me uh, even though they're turned off, we're really talking about a transmitter function. And I'm on the egg liner. Oh, we broke through the barrier. And if I hit that star button, see it stopped the other one at 75. Yeah. Which is pretty neat. Yes. When you 
I believe they will delay for their own delay time, so you would have to be careful to set them up. Speaking of which, something that's not in the presentation, because, but because you asked the question, let me do this for you. I'll get out of your way again. Look at this. Copy locomotive. So that if you're going to do a consist of, of six E8s, I think Lewis would be happy to sell you six E8s. You could define one of them, get the momentum set just the way you want, and you could copy it to the other five, which would save you a lot of time. It's not copying the whole transmitter to the other transmitter that someone requested, but you get the idea. It's pretty easy. That's why that's there. Okay. Let me get back to my uh, notes and see what I skipped. We did that. 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 Uh, oh, I, I put a bunch of notes on here before Lewis told me he got like a thousand CDs. All of the notes that I'm referring to here, like how to do the egg liner installation, it's on here. My article is in there, so you don't have to worry about going to the web. It's also on Aristocrats webpage, but that's what I'm skipping here. The manual is on there. All of those are on there. So it, all this is superfluous. Uh, consist, we did. There's no way to get more than six. Can, can you link two? at the same time simultaneously. In November there was a way to do it, but since they've changed it to this new way, I don't believe you can give two, remember that, that number at the very beginning, that zero? If you give two locomotives the same number, I think it might work, but it might get confused because it's bi-directional and the receiver is going to be getting, so I don't know. If you've got more than six, you know. All right, so you have a you know, and you have another consist of six. Can you then MU the two consists together to make 12? No, because you don't MU by cab number, you MU by locomotive name. So no, you cannot. I understand what you're asking. I would suggest if you've got enough money to have a consist of 12 by two transmitters, and you know, that, that's probably a better way to do it. Uh, again, I've done this, I've done this. Oh, again, the star key, remember with the asterisk? Uh, da, 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 we did that. Oh, this is important. Smoke units draw a lot of power because it's a heat uh, generating device and a resistance heater. You cannot connect a smoke unit directly to the output pins on the receiver. You'll fry it. Actually, it just wouldn't do anything. So included with the system is a smoke control board. This little guy comes with it, and I have one in the E8. What you do is you unplug the power. Oh, let me go into this for a second. This is the auxiliary wiring harness on that board. You see the seven wires? The black one is common, like a ground. Then the A, B, C, D, E, F. A is one, B is two, okay? And I have the brown wire, which is all the way to the left, next to the black, hot, tied to the smoke unit, and the ground. And then I use the other wires to go to the, uh, to the sound card. But that's what you wind up with. You unplug the smoke units from the main train power, plug the, po the train power into this smoke board, and then you run the connections from it back into the smoke units so that you've got some power transistors in there to turn the smoke units on and off without going through the receiver. Draw it. It's actually latching a low voltage relay. Uh, it's, it's solid state. It's not, a, it's not a latch. Remember, the latching is in the, the button. Right, the latching is in the button, but right, there's a bunch of whatever in there. Transistors. Transistors. That turn it on and off. Yes. Uh, both smoke units go through. It will accept uh, or, or power two smoke units. So if you only have one, you don't use the second plug. Uh, that's another article on that. It's on your CD. This is on your CD, how to hook it up to a Phoenix uh, sound card. You can do up to six. Oh, back up, page up. This is not available yet, but I hope to have one of my hands to test in the next month or two. There'll be an accessory controller that'll go trackside and will hook up to as many as six switch motors so that you can use the same remote to do your, your switch motors. And I'm assuming, again, I'll get into trouble making assumptions, since it's bi-directional, it'll actually tell me if switch number one is this way or this way. It'll give me feedback, which is one of the problems with a lot of other controllers. You hit it once, it goes that way, but did I hit it once or twice? And it, you know. All right, I use this thing. We had a break in the weather in Pittsburgh a week or so ago, and I got my track straightened out enough, and my 
dog's stuffy knocks all over the track, cleared enough to run locomotives. And I, I use this outside for the first time. Some observations. It probably took me 30 seconds, as I said earlier, to figure out how to do it without looking at it. So I just kind of was walking around and you know, pushing buttons and going fast, and so it's kind of nice. So you don't really need to look at it all the time. Very responsive. Anybody that's ever had a railroad in a snow belt knows what the track and everything looks like first run in the spring. Actually, my run, I think, was before the first day of spring. I was starting and stopping and reversing and emergency stopping and this thing rolled down the hill once and you know that sort of stuff but it was very very responsive to what I was trying to do. Did you try for distance? Uh, not in that particular instance I did not. I tried that at the park and that was you know, as I said about 400 feet. If you're impatient like I am, if you reverse it and you hold down the go fast button it'll take the go fast command while it's still in that pause mode which is kind of nice. Does that make sense? Even though if you put a five second pause in between forward and reverse, you could actually say reverse, hold the go fast button, it'll start racking up, and as soon as it's done with the pause, it'll take off. I like that because I'm, again, impatient. One of the things I do want to recommend to Lewis, because I got into trouble with this, I put the thing in my back pocket, and I, I inadvertently hit the menu button, which in effect kills it. And then I was trying to stop a train without looking. Well, I was doing menu functions. <laughs> so, you know, it'd be kind of neat to have a slide switch on the side that locks it, but that may or may not happen. And those are my observations. At that point, that's the end of the presentation, but I have questions, or time for questions. Yes? Well, here's the sequence as I understand it. And again, Lewis is the guy to talk to. Uh, the beta test units uh, will be in the hands of the beta testers, 150 of them, uh, next week. I, if, if I were Lewis, I would give them at least a month, if not more than that. And after that, we'll get feedback, maybe rewrite some things in the manual. There are probably mistakes in the manual because, it, again, it's a draft. Uh, change the software. Maybe we'll change some of the things that we talked about. Then he's going to order a thousand, I don't know. And it will take, how long does it take? A month to have those manufactured programs put on a container and shipped over here? I would guess end of summer, but that's a guess. Are they selling them now? No. What happened is, is if you uh, spend time on the Aristocrat website, about two months ago, Lewis said, I will sell 150 to beta testers, you know, and get those to you as soon as we can, but we have to get the FCC approval. Well, all that happened. That 150, so the important thing is this is not a, a piece of vaporware. It actually exists, and he's got 150 on hand that he's going to give to that first group of people. Other questions? You said that um, with the different locomotives, they haven't been able to link them so they have identical speeds to power. That's something you have to experiment with. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, well, again, if you bought two identical locomotives, they should have the same speed. But if you've got a USA Trains or an LGB, I think that's where you're going to get into trouble because I've had that problem. Right, but if you have a 45 and a 40. I don't know. Depending on their motor blocks. Exactly. Their motor blocks, their motor yeah, and I think most manufacturers strive to have the gearing right. Right. such that it matches speeds at a certain voltage. Right. Yeah. But again, brand new locomotive, five-year-old locomotive, that's a variable you can't deal with very easily. Yes? Uh, you said that there's an advanced uh, Receiver? Is that going to be a different receiver to get the 16? I don't know because it doesn't exist. And the next question is, um, when they put out these different accessories, how do you update the handheld? The handheld is reprogrammable by Aristocrat. And again, my understanding is you send it back, they'll reprogram it. Uh, I believe I've heard a number in the $20, $30 range for reprogramming, and they'll send it back to you. I, not yet, but keep in mind. Well, go ahead. My, my, my concern is, you know, right now this unit's coming out. You don't have the 16 expansion board available. You don't have the track site available yet. 
So if you get one today and that stuff comes out by the end of the year, are you going to have to send that back to get them to reprogram it to be able to support those features? Right now, it supports both of those features in the transmitter software because they've designed the transmitter software to work with something that is, has been planned but it doesn't exist as a, a piece of you know, plastic, metal, and circuit board. Does that make sense? They know what protocols they're going to use to make that operate. But again, in answer to your question, I don't, I don't know. My guess is it would not require reprogramming for that. Yes? Uh, there is also talk about making this a, a smaller receiver, same transmitter, to work with HO. Yeah. Because that's, that's a big market. I mean, you know, that's, that's not a bad size. You, the receiver, the thing that makes the receiver big is the, the, uh, the H bridge and the bridge rectifier to handle 20 some volts at up to a continuous 5 amps and surge up to 8. That's a lot of power. Yes? In the forum a couple months ago, there yes. was a discussion with BAP BMM. Yes. And the equivalent of operation of this. Yes. Kind of, uh, I don't believe that's been implemented yet. That's, that may be on a to-do list. That would be, again, something you might want to put to Lewis. No evidence. No, no. Back EMF is tricky. It's tricky to get to operate. Well, they weren't going to do it that way. They were going to do it. Yeah, I, I remember that conversation, and I don't believe, and again, I, I, when I ran my trains outside, I was more interested in getting them around without falling down the hill rather than seeing if they slowed down going uphill. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.